There we go. Do you actually, do you hear me better now? Do I sound that's, better? That's way better. Yeah, exactly. So it was like it was switched to the wrong device and you had to turn off the recording to switch between devices. And, uh, you know, all of these like the problems, the you kind of discover on the fly recording with a guest or like you export the file, you're done recording and then all of a sudden like there's dropped frames and things like that. I've had all kinds of problems but still way better than like 10 years ago when it was like oh, Skype man. or whatever. <laughs> we've, we've come a long way. I had one guest that was recording was recording in an Airbnb in South America somewhere. I could hear the, like the tropical birds and stuff. And like, dude, the, the echo was insane to start. And to, to Zoom's credit, we tried three bits of software and Zoom was the only one that could handle just such a poor connection. And we just pieced it together. And then I used all the software to clean up his audio. So two things. I've also been very impressed with Zoom. Like when the pandemic started and everything, and they were kind of like a huge improvement. But their recording uh, facilities are not great. Like it's tough to like get to. At least at the time, it wasn't giving you like two different video files and things like that. But also, I find that you know I just publish it with like bad video or something like that. Or sometimes you know I clean up the audio and like there's maybe like discrepancies between how it sounds because we change the setting in the middle. Like I've I've sort of come to this place where you know I don't care as, as much. I'm not producing for like I don't know. This is not the BBC or Discovery. This is not like a high budget like Hollywood. You know, <laughs> it's just a good, good mindset to be in. Shit. Like you're actually gonna ship then. Um, on Zoom as well, uh, there was like when I think when we did it there's an option that you have to tick. I don't think it's default where it extracts the video into two tracks. So we were, we were speaking over each other and the audio tracks weren't separated. And it, it's just like the way I, I do my intermissions in the podcast, it's like we speak over each other like crazy and I have to like manually move, move stuff. So Zoom was, yeah, anyway, we won't go there. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's see how this is going to turn out let's see how this software is gonna but speaking of uh I, there's an intro i need to do the intro this is design discipline my name is mehmet aydan baitash today i'm talking to rob O. rob is a south african designer and creator who runs one page love and hosts the yo podcast he's currently working full time on his self-owned portfolio of internet businesses after a decade of freelancing when he's not building online he loves to surf, travel, and listen to 90s punk rock. Is that all the information needed, Rob? Is there any other th- anything else about you that our audience has to know before we go on with the conversation? You pretty much nailed it, but you left out the part that I've been failing online for about 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's good, sort of like, we kind of expect that now. Like if you, if you, you know, I've, I've sort of experiencing also myself, you know, with this podcast and with other projects, it takes years of failure to get any kind of success that sort of makes any any visible difference in your life that might be like replacing your freelance income or uh, any other sort of economic event that that might change something in your life it's going to take years of work it doesn't there's maybe you know we hear the stories of like these super lucky people who found like this one idea and like a week later they were rich but the reason we hear those stories is that, that they are so rare <laughs> like it happens so rarely that whenever something like that happens it ends up on the news and uh, for the rest of us, I think it's years of work on whatever we choose to work on. Yeah, so yeah, uh, we could we could go so deep on that topic, but I want just like broadly put, is that y- you're naive if you're just starting out and you expect to have a 100 percent strike rate. It's like just one thing. I look back and I'm like, if you like look at my you know portfolio list of projects, it's like fail, learn something, you know, apply that to the next. Fail, fail. That one did really cool. Learned a lot. Had fun. Fail, 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 fail. One sold that. Fail, fail, fail. Like that's just that's how it is. And like you'll tell anyone who's experienced, um, even if someone's twenty years in the game building their own stuff, they will still, they will still like lower their expectations even on their next launch because they're like it's a still a lottery online and like nothing is a sure thing. You know, you can drop something on Product Hunt. You know, just say for your launch and on the same day, you know, Apple release, you know, Apple AI or something. And you're just like, you get, you get buried. So yeah, expectations are there. Today I learned something. I found something out. I I actually, I was trying it out and I just discovered it. It was almost like a scientific discovery where I found out today that you can actually get AI, like just, you know, off the shelf chat GPT or perplexity or things like that. You can get them to build out like 
business plans and cash flow analyses for any kind of project, including like, for example, I'm going to make a podcast, I'm going to make a Substack blog. What's going to be the cash flow for this uh, related to like various metrics? And it tells you, you know, like for the first 24 months, this is what your subscriber count is going to look like. This is the work that you have to do. This is the money that you're going to make when you do this work. And, uh, you know, I can tell you the numbers were grim. <laughs> the numbers were not generous. So I <laughs> I tend to believe that because, you know. <laughs> What's great about the AI generated um, reports, like I've seen them, is that it's just quite an eye opener for the amount of work you've got to put in as well. You know, a lot of people think it's like, oh, if I get the guests, you know, that'll, that'll happen. But like there's a thing called distribution, which no one talks about when you start a podcast. And it's so difficult. But anyway, then they're like, okay, so you really want to start a business? And then it's like, okay, well, we, this is what you're going to do. Who are you going to outsource to, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, it's cool to get kickstarted with your um, your kind of point of view with those, but uh, I don't dive too deep in someone else telling me how it's going to work. I'm also sort of on a quest to replace my uh, freelance income or employment income with products and assets and sort of, you know, you might call it passive income, but I do know that it's not passive and you do have to continuously work on it. Uh, it's just that it, it just, it's, it's such a, it feels like mathematically it's the right choice to do compared to being employed somewhere where your upside is kind of capped. Whereas over the long term, you know, any business that you own it could be a podcast, it could be a laundry machine <laughs> or vending machine, or it could be like construction company, whatever you have, a- anything over time, if you really put the work in it, the thing that you own is always, always going to have the better economic possibility and it was exciting to see that you can actually make this estimation. Like, if I put in this work, okay, after a year, what's it going to become? Uh, this is like people charge a lot of money to do that kind of thing. Like, before, as an entrepreneur, before I go into the thing, before I allocate, kind of like, okay, for the next year, I'm going to be working on this and this for like 10, 20 hours per week. Uh, before I make that allocation, I want to know uh, what the economic possibility is. And AI was surprisingly. Uh, good at making that estimation and sort of grounding, it, explaining how it made it. So you can actually see, oh, you know, this this makes sense. Like it's telling you things such as, you know, you're going to make a thousand dollars a month doing this and this after this much time, but you can actually see it in the numbers. It's almost like, like a McKinsey analyst doing the sort of business planning for you. But uh, speaking of, speaking of AI and passive income, uh, you have kind of set up this machine, I guess. You could call it a passive income machine, although I'm sure you will dispute that term and you, you'll you tell me like about all of the hours that you spend on it right now. But there is this machine that you built called One Page Love, which is, as I understand, providing you with a lot of your income today as, as a designer, as a creator. Tell me one thing that you know today, now that you have this functioning business that you didn't know before. Ideally, something that maybe enabled you to pull it off. Once you realize this, it sort of fell into place and you were able to uh, stop freelancing and do products full time? That's a fantastic question. So w- just like one, like the biggest one is that when you start the thing, you, you pretty much are unsure that this could ever be, you know, your full time job. And it is. So like in hindsight, you know, the advice you tell yourself, you know, back then is like, keep pushing, but, but, but it's not that simple. It's never that simple. You know, a lot of the time people are asking me, you know, how do I monetize? Uh, it depends, you know, how niche you're going. Uh, when I launched One Page Love, which is an inspiration gallery that niches to just single page websites, you know, at the time I couldn't find references to good, well-built, well-designed single page websites. I couldn't find it. So I was on this permanent hunt and I would search and I couldn't find it. And, you know, maybe it's the the builder in me, the maker in me, I was like, okay, well then I need to solve this problem. And I've had that for many, many, many other uh, use cases. But with One Page Love, you know, I was building websites at the same time. I was building sites for clients and clients would give me this, you know, half a page Word document and say, I need to buy, I I need you to build me a six page website. And I'd be like, why six? And they're like, because everyone else has six, (laughs) you know? And you're like, "But, but there's not enough content. Like we'd have to get them clicking around five times to try just get everything that that's in your half page document that doesn't make any sense so i didn't have enough references to convince them you know otherwise so i started curating i started collecting i was on a big hunt but to you know in let's not go too deep on that but like to back on your question is like what i tell myself at the time anyone listening is that like 
you need to solve your own problem because when you're solving your own problem, then it becomes a lot easier and it's a lot more organic. You have way more motivation that you're trying to just make a buck online by targeting a niche that you don't really love. And then there's other competitors out there and, you know, two or three dudes that you're following that actually really into the subject more than them, but you're like, uh, more than you. And you're like, oh, but I'm smarter than them. You know, like I can, you know, try and target something that I know. And you're just like, you're competing. Sure. Maybe it's a competitor side, but I think ultimately is that the person that wins is the person that truly loves what they're building and it's solving their problem. That solved, you know, my problem for years and years and years. I eventually, you know, quit freelance and then I kept creating content and I was creating tutorials for brands. And then I was like, cool, I'm going to create an ebook. And even writing the ebook, which had to do with landing page design, I'm looking for references to FAQ sections in landing pages. And I'm so deep within my own website. And it's like, oh, that search sucks. Oh, that, that category is not enough. And it's, I'm in there. I've been in there for 16 years. And I feel like if I wasn't using my own site, if I wasn't truly passionate about simplistic design, you know, namely one page websites, I would have binned it long ago. I wouldn't have been able to see the monetization. I wouldn't have even had the uh, energy to chat to users and get feedback. So there's so much. I mean, there's so much, but like solve your problem, start small, get it out the door. That's the advice if you if you are looking to eventually create something big. That's super good advice. And the reason I think it's good is that it's actually advice that I've been also giving to people for years. <laughs> so I can corroborate it. Like in the context for me was that I was at the university and I was supervising a lot of like, you know, teaching like design, user-centered design, design thinking, that sort of thing. Students are doing projects. Uh, implementing these methodologies were, or, or even s sometimes more serious sort of academic research projects that we're actually going to publish in like journals and things like that. And uh, with, with less experienced students, the, 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 the most common like failure modality was that they would choose an audience for whom to build something, design something, which to them was like, it sounded like an interesting thing to do, but that audience for them was actually not accessible. So let's imagine, for example, my students would come and they, would, they were like, you know, hey, we're going to build a programming language for blind people. And we're going to, you know, design, design think our way, or that's going to be our design project or whatever. And I was like, you know, okay, that's, you know, that sounds like a honorable goal, but like, how many blind people do you know? Like, are you, you need like five, 10, 15 people to actually do this study. You need like in, in, in our world now in the commercial world is customers, but in that world, it's like, you know, research participants that will give you data. Where are you going to find these people? Like to do that work, to reach to that audience, you're going to have to spend so many hours. Like why not just pick a audience or a customer uh, group that you're already close to? Maybe that you're already serving as a freelancer, maybe yourself as a freelancer. So, you know, you know, you're very familiar with the problems of a web design freelancer. Why not build something to solve those problems? Those are, I think, especially as a small business entrepreneur, like solopreneurs like you and me, that's sort of the winning strategy I find. Uh, we don't have like the resources to do like user research with, you know, under people that we, that's not, that's not possible. So that was, that was from the academic context. And I see the value of the same advice again in the, in the commercial context too, but your podcast, man, like we, so one page love, that's sort of your main, I guess, project, but I, the, the project that you do, which I'm super excited about is your podcast. I just, I just fucking love your voice. I think you, you have this, like, it's such an amazing presence. Like I, you are uh the the an important reason why i listen to your podcast the way that you produce it also the way that you produce it like in the moment as 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 a speaker the presence you have but also the post production it's super impressive and you got like you got rasmus andersson i saw today that's how you pronounce his name in swedish <laughs> uh he's super impressive guy uh he's an idol of mine like you know super impressive designer he designed an entire typeface but also really like legit engineer you know uh and that is the kind of person that i admire like people like you or rasmus who don't care about certain boundaries of like what designers are expected to do you go to engineering and then you go make pictures and then you go make a typeface just whatever it takes really to get the thing done and to ship something uh so that's the kind of person i look up to what is the kind of person that you look up to? And I'm asking this in the context of the podcast because I uh, expect that those are the kind of 
people you look up to that that are actually the guests on your show. So what? How do you define that kind of person? How do you seek them out? What have you learned from them? Tell me about this cohort of people and uh, what would you've gained from this experience of making the podcast? I need to try, you know, try keep this within three hours. <laughs> but, but you know, first of all, thank you. I really do appreciate that. Uh, you know, the monetary side of the podcast, as you're very aware of, is is grueling. You know, I, I'm still not there in a place where I feel like it makes any money uh, versus the hours. So, you know, these kind of comments, these kind of interactions I have with people, like knowing that people get inspiration and maybe this has inspired you to, you know, chat to someone, to reach out to someone, and then you have a stimulating conversation. That's like a, a snowball effect, which is I really bank and keep close um, when I have those dips uh, when creating that podcast. So I want to just, you know, round it off to say, I mean, round it up to say, that I like to be creative, and that's something that I've identified over the years. I'm not, I'm not good at drawing and that stuff, but I really like music. I used to play in a band, and love traveling, and I love you know art films. I, I can't really pinpoint this, but I do know that I like to mix music into interviews, and I like when people laugh, and I like to see the reaction when I've you know, really dug deep and extracted a nugget that they're like, whoa, how did you guess that? You know, my favorite interview show ever is Hot Ones on YouTube. And, you know, Sean Evans, the guest, he, you know, I read it in the comments and I've drawn a lot of inspiration from this where people go, wow, just did you see the reaction of, you know, ex-celebrity when he mentioned that thing? And like, I know that's the moment. I know that's the moment that everyone's like, wow, he's, He's honestly the best. The show's the best. So I've always drawn inspiration there and tried to get some form of like extra effort just to try and, um, you know, get that delight or surprise from my guest. Anyway, I'm definitely going to circle back to who uh, inspires me and so on. But I, I, you know, I wasn't big on podcasts when I started it. Um, You know, I originally started a Yo! YouTube show, which was just like me talking about design and development and but the the brand yo was just me being creative on like color and music and so on. And th- it's sort of like pivoted into a podcast. And then, but, but, but I remember clearly like, oh, so podcasts are big. This is 2019. And it's like, okay, so people like short podcasts. People like super long podcasts. I don't really listen to podcasts. Like, but I probably, this is sort of organically what I should do next. So I was like, what I have to do? It's like, I have to create the podcast that I, I would want to listen to. So I want the podcast to end with a, a you know productive beat. Like that's a non-negotiable. It must just end off. The guys must say cheers. And then I want to just get amped to go work. So at the end of every single episode, we'll have some cool music. Um, I want intermissions. I want games. So the whole thing with the format that's grown over time is that we start off and we, you know, we shoot the shit a little and we just loosen up, but then we go into a game and that really like lowers, um, you know, the boundary they have around them and the force field. And it's just like, I get in there and they like loosen up and then I loosen up and then they start storytelling. So once they go and then as soon as they, cause almost every podcast sort of dips at a point where like, cool, we've told the story and like, how do we transition? How do we segue into a completely different topic? What, when they've run out of energy? And the answer is, is you just have a game. You have another game. And so we have the second game. And then once they've done the second game, they are totally loosened up. They're comfortable. They know me. And then normally, I don't do it every time, um, but normally right at the end, I'll just jab and I'll just ask something super emotional or deep and I'll get it from them and I'll get that tone and then we wrap it up. So it's like, that's a format I created over time. That's what I'd want to listen to. But, 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 but to, to research a guest on that level and also like to create a podcast that they'd really enjoy being a part of that they haven't experienced before means I need to ask different questions. So I listened to a lot of podcasts beforehand. Um, and I obviously just go, like research like crazy. You know, I go into archive.org. I, I pump their website in there. I go in the Wayback Machine. I see different variations of like the typefaces they used. Um, I'll find them on Spotify, Lost FM. I'll, ch- I'll play all their playlists. Um, like Rasmus was interesting because I'm just I'm just mentioning because he's my recent guest and you, you you admire him but like you know his his playlist was super interesting um 
and it was like this like sort of electronic um i knew that abba was big in sweden and then i tried to find abba within spotify his playlist just to see and there wasn't there there was no abba in his playlist so then i was like that could be funny and it's like i go that deep and and the whole thing as well like one thing you got to remember is that if you probably ask all the questions that you set out to ask you probably didn't go hard enough like you probably like there's a I, I go really far and go saying like oh that's a bit risky that's a bit risky and then i chip it down so it's like i'll really have a like in my research notes i have a lot of silly stuff like like way edgy way difficult and then when it comes to the actual interview like i'll have a few there and then i'll only ask it if it if it warrants the the tone so that's sort of how i do it um i mean i i promise you twitter is absolutely incredible i will search their handle and then their birthday their handle and then a swear word their handle and like to see what they're angry about like like there's so much i can extract from twitter over the years and you'll see most of my guests on twitter um and that's really helped me so yeah okay so so back to your point about um you know the effort i put in but the people that i admire it's it's interesting because everyone i've looked up to over my life like pretty much every single guest um only one guest is sort of recent on my radar, which was Grace Walker, which I've only been following for like a year. Everyone I've been following for many, many, many years. And in my journey, like I, it's so organic because when, when it comes to the interview, like I know so much already and, but then I'd like do the research and that combined is really good um, just for like chemistry. But I, I must tell you an X factor that no one you know really realizes in this podcast game and i think we've touched on this a little bit in the past but is that because i started one page love in 2008 is that i have been adding consistent content for years and years and years and it's grown up a following and that site has 150,000 uh you know unique designers developers and makers that come a month and what i've done over the years is that i have featured the projects and websites of most of my guests. So what often happens is that I've been, I've I've like, you know, I had a guest. I'll show you a perfect example, like like Pablo Stanley, such a good example. Um, I've known him for years. Um, I've known of him for years. He has followed me, but then I've been like sort of, like when he does something really crazy, I would like save a story, you know, in my notion, just because I know if he's ever on the podcast, like that's something that I'd love to bring up. I haven't even asked him yet. Um, just like the big ones though, like, you know, just easy to do, drop a tweet link, drop a tweet link, drop a tweet link. And then I'll feature one of his projects on one page love, you know, just for free, you know, he didn't submit or anything. And then the traffic comes to him. He starts getting some sales on his course. And just like this, Pablo Stanley slides into my DMs going, dude, you've sold like 20 courses or something. Um, thanks so much. And then I'm like, oh man, I'm like, oh, Pablo, dude, like, you know, it's only a pleasure. Like a really, like the course trailer was incredible, blah, blah. And then like, he, he's like back and forth. And I'm like, I mean, there's no better time to ask someone to come on your podcast. It's like, that's it. So that has happened to me like many, many, many times. Um, so then, so sure, I've asked people, um, but most of them know me beforehand. That's all I'm saying. And like, when it comes to the ask, I have a bit of leverage. So I'll ask and say like, hey, girl, sure. Like, I'm just, you know, a big fan of the years. Um, I featured you in my ebook and like, uh, I've also got a profile on one page. Like, we've actually interacted a bit on Twitter and so on. And, and he's like, yeah, yeah, sure, Rob, whatever. And it's like, I'd love to be, would you love to be a guest? And then he knows me. It's not cold. Um, I don't know if I've asked anyone out the blue that didn't totally know me. Um, so anyway, okay. So, so, but like, there's still the, the points I'm not putting across here is that, yo is my creative outlet and i am interacting with people that i really admire and and respect and i'm trying to give them the podcast that they'd really enjoy you know like a lot of them i'm i don't want to toot my own horn here but like i would say 70 percent of them have said wow that was like the best podcast i've been on because it was just so different and we laughed and we did you know such unusual things different questions etc and and that's what that's what like when they tell me that like the sponsor and the money like doesn't really matter it's like don't forget is that i'm sitting at the tip of africa you know i'm in cape town don't go to a lot of conferences i don't interact with a lot of people so here i am and i get like an hour with them 
I'm super thankful. So when it comes to research, when it comes to the editing, I just think I've got one shot at this. I'm just going to go all in. It's one of those things that you, you know, build once and it's just distributed for eternity. And it's an incredible feeling knowing that these will live longer than me too. So full effort. I bleed with every episode, every person I look up to. Um, Webflow, who are the current sponsor of the current season, like I'm insanely grateful for them because they, I, we were in discussion and I was like, I'm not sure I can do it because I've got a, I really want to do a course and got so much on. I just had a little boy and they're like, Hey, you know, you know what? Thank you. Thank you. And they're like, what, you know, what can we do? And like, maybe we should just take this opportunity to level it up, be more creative, um, make it video and so on. So you can see why I'm, I keep leaning back to creativity. Like if I wasn't going to, you know, learn a lot from this episode, um, and you know, level up considerably. I probably wouldn't have done the season. Sorry, season, not episode. Anyway, that was a ramble. I'm really, really grateful f- um, for you listening and and telling me that you're getting inspiration from it. Would I recommend a podcast to someone? Um, yes, if you want to, you know, level up different skills like editing and so on. Like it's a good opportunity. It's a forced way to learn. Uh, are you going to make money in a podcast? Uh, I. <laughs> Yeah, if you keep going and keep going and keep going. I, unfortunately, it's just one of those things where I truly believe that the only real way to, you know, if you want to become a full-time podcaster, you just have to keep going and you have to interview a lot of people. And and it's unfortunate. For the format I've created, it's unsustainable to create a lot of episodes um, unless you level up production and income. So I'm just enjoying the journey right now. But thanks for the kind words. I think it's one of my favorite podcasts, by the way. I've just, I've listened to most of your episodes, literally, and you have had some people in there who are like, personally, some of my sort of heroes and people that I would like to have on the podcast. Rasmus is one example, but also uh, Trough and uh, the, the I forgot his name, but uh, Whale is his handle, the, the, the guy who founded Bunsen. He was uh, such such an inspiration. He's- such a, a legend it can, I, should, I need to add one more thing sorry sorry to interrupt you you're talking about locking in these guys and you know they'd be great no one talks about this is that even with the leverage i i have and even the interactions i've had with the guests over the years we will book dates and they'll fall away and this happens all the time um rasmus rasmus we we, you know, credit to him, and like he's a he's he's a prolific guy, and I'm just so stoked that that he got some time with me. But you know, we originally, um, someone tagged me on Twitter just saying, "Hey, oh, I'd love to, I'd love Rasmus to be on the Yo podcast." And then Rasmus just replied and said, "Like sure, you know." And then I got him on the DMs, and I was like, "Sweet dude, when when suits you?" And he and he then it was like silence, and then. All of a sudden, it's like, okay, cool. I'll just try again. I don't want to be too pushy. And then we sort of lock in a rough time, and but like no set dates. And then I like try and nudge him, and then nothing. And it totally fell away. 2021 is when Rasmus and I were meant to record. So now, years later, it happened again. And now, only like like right now, and like again, I'm not here to throw shade at all. It's like he's he just had a baby as well. And like I, I, I'm so thankful that he took a moment in this like schedule. This baby's really young, but we, I, I got him on Twitter DMs, on emails, on Instagram messages. Like I became like ex girlfriend material just because I had to get this one over the line, and I actually landed up just getting him. And I got him on WhatsApp, and we've been communicating via that. Dan Petty, we tried four times. You know. There's, there's people that have just fallen through where they're just not replying anymore. You know, the inboxes are probably flooded. I remember Dan Petty uh, saying, actually, I don't even check my email anymore. You know, and I had been rep- I had been asking him by email for ages. So just I need to, like, I, your question was sort of like about starting a podcast or at least being a, a, a podcast host. And people don't realize that you will promise, you, you will grow an audience and you will get a guest locked in. And then you will announce that guest to your audience. Your audience will send questions for that person. And then that person will disappear into the ether and you'll be left there. And I'm just saying it's part of the game. So it's just like lower your expectations there. So yeah. 
Yeah, hundred percent. I think even like higher level, you know, these are these people are productive that we want to have on the podcast that we want to talk to. We want to, you know, these, these interesting people. They are, the reason they are interesting is they're productive. And I think, at least in my own life, I recognize that productivity comes from saying no. There's a whole element of like, you know, you just remove all of the things that are not the thing that you want to produce, and that's how you're able to produce things. That's my sort of tactic, and it's I, I respect a person who does that and says you know hey i have these projects right now i can't do a podcast with like you no matter how fun it might be that's just part of the discipline of being productive and uh it does take like if you want to be among those productive people you kind of have to practice that but also like persistence and all of the other traits that you can read in the, in the books about productivity and and startups and things like that but I do wonder, by the way, so I'm a, I'm a huge, I've become a huge nerd of, uh, of time management recently, tracking my time. I have, a, I have an app. It's called Rise. They are not sponsoring this podcast, but I think they should because I really like them. <laughs> and I like to share with my audience. Yeah, I like to share with my audience the, the products and sponsors that, that I like. And by the way, we do have a few affiliate sponsors. Please check out the website for this episode, the descriptions, etc., where you'll find links to them. So you can you can support us by clicking those links. But uh, these are all products that I really love to bring in. So I'm using this this particular app. It's called Rise. It listens to everything I do on the computer. I can sort of categorize them based on projects and it allows me to exactly know to the minute how much time I'm spending on particular projects. So I know exactly, I can tell you this month, how much, how many hours did I spend on design discipline on the podcast? How many hours did I spend on client X and client Y as, as I do freelance work? How much hours did I spend? I'm building a SaaS right, right now, which I don't want to announce. You've seen it, but uh, the, keep, keep it between us. Give it a secret for now. So like how many hours am I programming that SaaS? I know exactly. Do you track this? Do you know? Do you have any idea how much work it, it takes for this podcast and all the other things? It's so funny because I was tracking. And once I'd realized how long I spent editing the Dan Petty episode, then I, I stopped tracking. <laughs> I was like, this, this, this is going to upset me. And I, it just doesn't make any financial sense. But really though, it's like the, the question there that, you know, you've brought up is the intentionality and like, what, like, do you know what you should work on and like how long it takes to do things? And that's just a muscle that, you know, you've grown over time. Uh, if I find myself like scrolling Instagram, for example, I know that, you know, I'm probably, you know, not stimulated on something I'm doing. And I even trying to do that thing, I'm going to be unproductive in that window. So then I'll tr just get outside, run up the mountain go so but I'm, i must admit and i am really thankful that i've still got this 20 years in the game is that i i'm really really still motivated to get to work here and you know monday comes monday morning i cannot wait to just you know start working one page love editing on the podcast you know the editing is a love hate thing here it's like if i you know just tighten things and like just repetitive repetitive that sucks but then all of a sudden i'm like you're reflecting on something someone said you know, 10 times. I'm like, wow, that really actually like hits now. And then secondly is that then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, we could actually probably throw a little sound effect there of like a car coming past. Or and then I, then all of a sudden I start getting creative. And then all of a sudden I have like unlimited, unlimited energy in the bank. But then, but then to your point about the time, and this is where it gets debatable, is that if I'm lost in being creative in my own stuff, then time doesn't really matter. It's like, it, I, I'm in the middle. I'm in the journey. Like I don't want time to stop. Like and yeah. and like then I just know I was having a good time. But yeah, I've I've automation massive. Uh, I've the stuff that I really hate doing is posting to social media. Like one page love. I've got automations in in place where you know I hit post in WordPress and then you know it goes through ImageX and then it goes and auto post to Pinterest and auto post to Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I'm just trying to, you know, work less on stuff that I don't like doing. Um, and yes, I think it's very healthy to track for a month. It's like calorie counting. It it sucks. It's the worst thing in the world. But doing it for one month will pretty much open your eyes for the rest of your life. Um, I was going through a phase where I remember 
I would I would have lunch and then I wanted something like a little bit sweet and then I would have like a bowl of muesli that had was layered with sugar and it had like two thousand calories in it after lunch and like that kind of stuff I didn't realize so all of a sudden you look at your you know your app tracking and Apple's doing a really good job at this you know like there's some native stuff uh, within Mac OS that can tell you how long you're in applications but your one's probably more tracked on website URLs and so on and I feel like everyone should do it. Everyone should do it for at least a month uh, and just like an eye-opener for how long you're spending on maybe. I mean, I don't even use Facebook, but like back in the day, that was a big one. I remember about seven years ago when I was doing this tracking, I remember I was spending an hour a day on Facebook. I'm like, wow, how much is that per year? And then I'm talking about like, I don't have enough time to ship something. And I'm like, you're a hypocrite. So yeah, so it is, it is. To answer your question, like, am I tracking time? No longer, because I don't want to know, like, how long the stuff takes. But uh, generally, if I'm not really loving the work I'm doing, I try and pivot. Um, I often procrastinate with work I still have to do. So, like, I'll procrastinate by listening to some, you know, drum and bass while designing podcast uh, artwork. Like, that's my procrastination. Because I don't have any clients and so on, like, I often, if, oh, this edit's so difficult. Like, I'll procrastinate but doing something that's that's rad. So yeah, I mean, it's a good place to be, but yeah, not tracking time. Yeah, I mean, I hear you, man. Like you're so, you sort of get it. I know this is fun. This, this, the work that we do is just so amazing. I, it's just, we are blessed to be able to make a living doing this kind of work. It's just so nice to be creative, design things, build things. The reason actually why I started tracking your time in the first place even was I was spending like easily 10, 12 hours a day on the computer. And uh, I, I was getting like back pain. I had a period where I was like chair shopping even. Now I got back into like very frequent uh, yoga practice, which I had sort of it, uh, I had slowed down for a while. But really, I'm, I'm just so excited about doing the work that I do. I can just do it all the time. And it's just not healthy to sit on a chair in front of a screen all the time. And that's why I'm doing it to like keep myself under control. <laughs> Let's take this moment and ask you, what is a task that time just evaporates? Like you could do that thing forever. So with some music? Coding. Uh, I can have music. I don't have to. I like to listen to music when I'm doing like tedious things. So if I'm copying and pasting data from somewhere to somewhere, I'll put on some music. But other, like if I'm writing or coding, I like to just think. I like the sound of the, you know, just no sound and just, focusing on that uh, do you listen to a lot of music while you work yeah i mean i listen to so i'm big i'm big into punk rock but and, and I'm a lot of metal as well growing up but definitely punk rock is my roots and you know, i know you're in you're in gothenburg now you, your turkish origin moved to sweden right exactly exactly yeah so so i had this combo with uh, rasmus anderson after the podcast as well but like i I was so into Swedish punk rock growing up. Um, I used to, I actually burnt a CD and I, that's how I knew the Swedish flag. Cause I like, I, I put that as the cover of my, like I printed it on, you know, that like really cheap paper. And like, it was so cheap that like, once you had spun the CD like 50 times, the tape just started coming off. Like, and, and like, and like, like warping. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a big part of my upbringing, punk rock, um, especially Swedish punk. And, but the lyrics kind of clash with my thinking at the moment. So I've transitioned sort of into a lot of drum and bass while while working because it's the tempo I need. It's just like it's, it keeps me going. And like the community as well, it's just one of those things that probably not a lot of people know, but the, the community side of drum and bass is really wholesome as much as you think it isn't. But there's a lot of cool podcasts and people looking out for each other. And I really, I really dig being a small part of that i'm like you know watching from the outside um but yeah while working designing listening to music un unlimited energy i love it um but the question to you though is that how many you know what percent of your day are you programming that you feel like that that you have that flow state so i can easily sit down and program for three or four hours or actually also writing do you though like um the question is like how much of your day do you get into that flow state and actually program I do um, around half the day. There, it's very common that I sit and write for like five hours or program for five hours. It's very common. I, I I might have some form of ADHD that I've never really had problems with, so it's not like diagnosed or anything. But 
I, I understand from other people that th this ability is not common to like sit down and write for five hours or code for five hours. I think I got it from like, I, I, I was raised in a very competitive education system and I studied a lot for exams, like to get into good schools in Turkey. Uh, you have to pass like centralized exams where you're competing with everyone your age. Literally every, every kid in the country who's your age is taking that exam. And there's like this five schools that are actually good. So you need to be in the top, like, uh, I was in top 10 in one of them and top, uh, 900 or something. And, uh, it was, uh, uh, it's something I don't wish upon my children. One reason I live here in Sweden is that I don't want them to go through that. Uh, but it does leave you with superpowers. It is, it is a traumatic experience, but you end up with like reading, writing, coding is just so easy to me and I can do it for and I enjoy it also. It's 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 very weird that I, I came to enjoy it. But hey, I guess when you build the skill, it's sort of like a skill uh, thing maybe. You do it for hours and hours and years and years. And at some point, you become to be able to enjoy like even a complicated book about, I don't know, philosophy or whatever I can pick up and read with pleasure. N not everything, of course, but you, you also get that i i understand that it's even more important maybe as i am also thinking about you know starting a family having children i'm thinking about okay you know how do i want to educate them how was i educated what is like because i'm also i'm very interested in education being an academic previously etc and i think maybe even like the brute forcing and gaining like the skill of like fast reading or being able to sit with something etc that's good but also even like more important is to make good decisions to have taste and to have strategy because then you can accomplish things in even shorter time speaking of strategy by the way now is the time that we make an intermission on this podcast and i want to try something with you that i haven't tried before with guests uh this is a new segment of design discipline this is called office hours uh and this is a premium paywall segment that we're going to do so we're going to talk privately with you for a few hours uh, no for a few minutes sorry <laughs> not hours i wish it could make could be hours i wish uh and this is going to be a premium segment published separately from the main podcast so office hours concept is young designers come to me and i give them advice regarding whatever they want to talk about i try to help them with advice that will help them achieve their goals what advice do you have for me you know the things that i build i've shown you some of the SAS experiments and design discipline uh, obviously the podcast, the publication, uh, I would, uh, like you one day would like to quit my freelancing and working for clients and just make my income on the order of, let's say at least, uh, $10,000 a month, a good round number with these projects. What would be, uh, some advice that you have in, to my particular situation, to my particular publications and portfolio of skills and products? that you think uh, would accelerate me for, as a person who's a little further in this journey. Office hours, this, this was, a, this was sort, of, sort of a different one because I was the one getting coached. Normally, I'm the one who's coaching, like, people come and ask, like, hey, how do we get our first job and things like that? So speaking of landing pages, and I know that you're sort of like the landing page expert now, having done all of this work around landing pages with one page love and other things. Do you apply the same principles of design, storytelling, and sequencing, and editing, and things like that between, let's say, landing pages, the podcast, um, any other design or creative work that, that you're doing? Uh, I've been reading a lot about this topic, going back to like storytelling, writing techniques, or like the hero's journey, and story structure, and mythology, and some archetypes, and things like that. I've just been reading a lot about this recently. So I wonder if there's any tactics, universal narrative structure tactics that you use, which are valuable to do in landing pages, but also when you're doing any creative work, like at the podcast or anything. The the hero's journey is so interesting, and you know I I'm trying to get better at just understanding storytelling. I got a friend who he consults for to Netflix for you know nature documentaries. And it's always, you know, always talk about like, how are we going to start this? They talk about the arc and so on. And yes, I understand, you know, I, I need to like, need to sidestep this next bit, you know, just saying is that there's a lot of landing page advice there that, you know, I don't totally agree with. Uh, if it works for you, great. Uh, there's a, there's a certain, there's a certain style of landing page I really enjoy. And there's a, there's a style of landing page that I don't enjoy. 
and often the one that I don't enjoy converts like crazy. Oh, and so 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 no, but and and the one I do enjoy also converts. So there's no single bit of advice in landing pages that can truly move the needle, in my opinion. Um, sure, I mean if if like you haven't covered the fundamentals, we can go there, and it's like. Yeah, you need to do that, and I'll, I'll I'll touch on those now. But when it comes to you know you you hear this bit of advice going, oh, you haven't applied storytelling to your landing page. That's super vague. I never understood what that meant until I read like five books about storytelling. It, exactly, exactly. So so, and then don't forget is that a lot of times you will ha- you hear a story about a a guy who's spun up you know, five sh- Shopify landing pages and he's got these dropshipping things happening and he's making a million dollars of each. And then there's someone else who's, you know, talking about just changing some colors and it like increased the conversion by this, but they've only got like one sale and this made two sales. So it's like, it's a 200% increase. And that's all like emitted from, so the landing page world in general, I try and stay away from. And that's like the kind of a, funny place to be when you're creating a course about landing pages or have an ebook about landing pages and like you know what my most of the websites that but I, sorry that's coming it, up right the course you're making a course yeah, right yeah. now and it's not released yet that's that's exciting yeah so so I'll, i can touch on that too just afterwards but is that you know when it comes to landing page design i i always ask myself like what do i truly appreciate when I stumble upon sites that excite me and you know why is this exciting for me and why is this making me excited to try this and I've always tried to like keep that close and saying like why 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 and often the time is that I I can experience that product a little bit in the page um yes there's clever copywriting yes the copywriting can identify with the problem I have and like there's Lots of like, you know, go to landing page advice and sure it all works. But I truly feel that if someone is trying to persuade me to act in a landing page with as little as possible, that means they have considered everything and they have extracted all the fluff out of landing page. And now I get excited. And this is where one pages come in because they're not encouraging you to click around for more information. They are trying to distill everything into one message and a classic landing page mistake is when someone is trying to get you to do a few things in a one a landing page where the truth is, is that everything needs to funnel you. And I hate using that word funnel, but like everything needs to direct you to do one thing. And if they're trying to tell you to do two things, then it's like your copy is diluted and then it's, it's like noisy. So you can see what I appreciate in a site, but the real kicker for me is that if someone spends that extra effort and they invest in really good visuals or media or something clever like an interactive demo in the page. And they are not just telling me that like this is the best. They are actually showing me. So my course is called Show Them. And the domain that I acquired that was an absolute monster to buy was show, is showthem.com. And I all I'm doing is I'm trying to celebrate um, landing pages that went the extra mile with visuals and good copy with as little as possible to try and get people excited and like delight the user. So yes, the the course has got, you know, chapters about, you know, what makes a, a landing page strong and like what not to do, where to put things, etc. There's the basics. But a huge part of the course is I've, you know, curated dozens and dozens of good examples that align with any use case you you need. Um, and that's just part of like everything I've done. And that's what excites me. So again, it's like, I want to create a course, but at the same time, I just want to, I don't want to create a course to, you know, just make money. It's like, I want to create an exciting course, a course I'd love. So I want visuals. I want to be able to get some assets. Um, I want the videos to have like, like maybe the odd little subtle, you know, exciting music at the end of a chapter. Maybe it's like, choose your adventure type of thing. Oh, did you understand this chapter? If, oh, you did? Cool. Definitely go. If you didn't, bonus video. You know, like, I want to create something really fun and engaging and exciting. But to answer your question, it's like, what what have I seen in landing pages that I've applied elsewhere? Is it's always been, it's always been, and absolutely everything I've done is that, what would this user appreciate at this point? It's like, when they arrive, what would they need to see and read 
to be persuaded to act. And you think you know because you're so deep into the product and you've been building it forever and you know exactly the technical specs of everything and you're just trying to like blast it at them. Oh, it does this and this and this. But it's like actually step in their shoes and ask yourself like, what problem do they really have? And like, how does yours solve it that's slightly different than your competitor? And then you're like, okay, well, that's kind of your unique selling point. And then we should maybe like just spotlight that a little bit more, you know? So it's like, there's a lot going on. And it's, again, there's, oh, should it identify with the user's problem? It's like, you need to do a little bit of that, a little bit of that. You need to remove a little bit of that. You need a little bit of that. And then all of a sudden you start strengthening your page. And that's when you start getting getting the conversions and getting that. So it's definitely not um, one big answer, but again, visual transformation, that's a huge part of the course where, and I use the example in a few talks I've done is that, you know, you can tell me like, hey, if you brush your teeth using this, you know, whitening toothpaste over 12 weeks, um, you will get white teeth. Imagine arriving at a landing page where it just said that. It just said that. It's like, if you buy this with this button, you will get white teeth. Cool. So now you are telling them. Then the second way to persuade is you get others to tell them. So this is your social proof. This is your testimonial. So all of a sudden below that copy, it, it goes, oh my word, my teeth whitened in like 12 weeks. But it's someone that's like a celebrity. And you're like, oh my word, the celebrity. So it becomes a lot more convincing, all the social proof and so on. So now it's become a little bit more convincing. So you know, the ways to persuade, you tell them or you get other people to tell them or you show them. So the third way, and this is basically the course, is that you show them. So how do you show them? Visual transformation. Below the testimonial or above or wherever you want it in the page is like some yellow teeth and to the right is some white teeth. And what makes, what brings it all together, what brings it all together is an actual realistic plan. Because imagine it's like those next to each other, like use the toothpaste, but like how long? And then all of a sudden there's a timeline that says like 12 weeks from A to B. So now think of that. You arrive at the landing page, your attention spans nothing, and you arrive there and you're not reading anything. Like you're really not reading it. Like people are skimming like crazy and people talk about, you know, a lot of landing page teachers will tell you like, hey, the copy needs to resonate with the user's problem. And you like arrive there and you start reading and discovering. But imagine just arriving and there's like yellow teeth and white teeth and it says 12 weeks. And you're like, okay, I, I get what's happening here. Like I know, I know what they're selling here. Like I know, and, and like I want to be there. So visual transformation. Um, there's so many examples. It's all in the course, but like you think of uh, a, an, even an email newsletter. Imagine getting a newsletter saying it's like, this is a new tent. It it's it like, it's such a compact design. You know, it's like it's like that's what it does. Or seeing someone in the mountain, and it's got that orange tent, and it's literally like in a bowl that's just like right there. And you're like, ah, oh, I want to be in the mountain, and I want my tent only to take that much space. So I, this sounds so trivial. I know, I know, but. You know, I, my point I'm bringing up, and I'm going to do this for the rest of my life, is that there's no set landing page advice that's truly going to move the needle. Like, there's no one thing. And identify with the user's problem. But, like, you have a photo that's that's really high res of an opinion leader in your scene that's actually got that, like, think how that makes you feel when you arrive. It's like, I want that. I want to be there. So... That's truly where I think landing pages move the needle. And that's what I appreciate is where they're like, wow, this team that made this product went into the mountain and got this photo. So what does that tell me about this product as well? Is that they truly care about this and they've tested it and they're showing me. So, yeah. In a way, this is very traditional, even like it's very traditional, like graphic design, marketing, advertising, this people in advertising have done this for like years and years. You look in magazine ads from the fifties and how many people in the Beatle? Yeah, exactly. But you know, this is also like, this is a cliche in design, but empathy, right? And when I look at your work or w when I actually listen to you talking today about the way that you think about your podcast guests, the way you think about landing page structure and the things you build and you, the way you just talk about everything that you do is always about a very deep understanding of other people and having empathy for, you know, putting yourself in the other person's shoes. This is very, this is kind of a cliche in design. 
so if you go and study like design thinking, I did like a certificate program at some point, and that this is what they teach you, like empathy, and then you do this and this to build. Like there's the classic sort of IDEO example where they're designing interfaces for like visually impaired people or something, and they put cream on their glasses to make their to make it blurry so that they can actually see what it's like. To, to not be able to see <laughs> and to what it's like to actually interact with it in that state. But I am unsure if the skill of empathy that you have, the depth of empathy that you have, I'm not sure if this is something that you can sort of learn from a course or develop through exercises. I suspect I have the impression that you've developed this as part of your personality from an early age. Can you tell me, and this is like you mentioned, you know, the heavy hitter questions at the end, right? So this is my heavy hitter question for you. Can you tell me a story from your childhood which really informed your work today and informed your personality and led you to these, uh, to, to this ability of being this designer with this very high level of empathy who's able to like build these really great sort of content, products, information, packages, just nice things for people by really truly understanding them. How, how did that first come about for you? It's a fantastic question. So I'll get there now while my brain percolates but but the 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 thing with empathy and I I do agree with you it can't really be taught. Um, you know we can have examples we can you know chat to people we can hear stories and so on. But I truly believe and and maybe I don't know you know maybe it's a, a religious like influence as well. I'm 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 like letting this one unfold. But you know I've always you know I had a journey with. A uh, little bit of Christianity, um, and I've I'm now full atheist. But mm. it's it's like I was always, you know, quite confused with the way people, you know, said things and did the opposite. Um, and I'm definitely not I'm definitely not um, pinpointing, you know, a certain religion at all. Definitely not Christianity. Um, some of my best friends are Christian, but. I remember I went down that journey and like a lot of my questions weren't answered and, and there was a lot of hypocrites and so on. And I was like, this makes no sense to me. And like, yeah, I had, you know, some some deaths uh, within the family where like some people were like the best people I knew um, influenced me in such a huge way and it made no sense. Uh, it's just like that, that, that doesn't make any sense because that's honestly where that person got, you know, pricked by a needle um and is a nurse and then dies and you're like and and so like i was very like maybe angry for a while and um confused and i would ask the questions and so on so the the way it went is that i over the years always told myself that like it seems like i'm the only one in charge of this place mm. it's like whatever i do you know it's like i'm accountable um you know from a from an arrogant point of view or egotistical point of view like i'm the master of my own universe i truly do believe that but at the same time it's like i'm the only one that's going to make it happen like i'm the only one in the way of myself it's like all excuses are mine so if you truly want to get somewhere you need to get out the way your excuses need to get out the way and you need to make it happen so I one of the the mottos or mantras that's really 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 stuck with me over the years is that like you basically got to do to others that you you'd want done to you like that's it like that is such a huge one you know you you got to respect elders there's all these other like things that people have been there before you and so on but that's the big one is that like if you are at the beach and you see some pollution and you would want someone else to pick that up and you don't pick it up. You're a total hypocrite. It's like you need to act. You need to do what you'd want others to do. And that's how like you can, you know, move the needle on the earth and make the world a better place. So yeah. always kept that close. Um, you're you're in an awkward situation in a bar and there's no one around. And you're like, oh, you know, what would I really like? Or you see someone else, you see someone else at the bar and it's like they're like lonely and like you're like, oh man, if I was in that situation, I would love it if someone just like spoke to me. And it's like, I'm always that guy who's going to find that person and go speak to them. Like I've done that for the last like 30 years. So it's, I'm, tr I'm trying to like, you know, like I say, I'm trying to unload here. Like I'm trying to go as deep as I can. 
Um, and I do feel that like keeping that close and trying to, you know, be accountable and like just lead, but like, but, but on my personal journey, you know, trying to just be that person that I would love to be and I'd love others to be. It's like, I feel like that is translated into um, the product building. It's like a lot of the time, you know, you'll see my, my promo videos for stuff or my promo is just so stripped out of fluff. You know, One Page Love has one sponsor and it's like, it's a banner from a brand I love. I non, It's like non-negotiable. I have to host the assets. I have to control the clicking. There's no scripts that are going to be loaded in this. It's like it needs to load within the thumbnails. It needs to be organic. It needs to look beautiful because that's exactly how I'd want it if I arrived at the site. Newsletter pop-up, I've never added one in my entire life to any site I've ever done because it's something I don't I don't appreciate. So for me to do that is massively hypocritical. Um, so I guess it's it's like a what do, what would I truly love and like stick to your values and build the products that you really appreciate. Um, yeah, but being creative at the same time, you know, with my ebook, it's like you know what I'd really dig is like I'd really dig an interactive version of each chapter where the author read the actual tip as well and then like i did that mm -hmm. because that's what i'd love so it is being creative tied in there anyway to answer your question back on the question is that um i do feel that maybe my journey through life of like trying to understand where i fit in the universe has influenced my product building i, I don't know if that answers your question that answers it perfectly it's, it's so fascinating i think you know my my mom and some other people in my family who actually are uh the, the sort of more religious people in my family also have this kind of uh, this this kind of empathy and deep sort of connection to other people. I somehow uh, ended up not having that level of of empathy, and I I've sort of it, I've been fortunate because I at some point in the last I don't know five or ten years recently actually in my life I recognized uh, that deficiency, and I've been sort of trying to gain that skill to sort of improve that side of myself, and I've been doing that through maybe like reading books about. Uh, human psychology and storytelling and sometimes it's even like even sort of these more sort of businessy cynical manipulative things like you know classic example although not it's not so cynical but like how to win friends and uh, influence people and things like that or the modern uh, books with like Jeffrey Pfeffer uh, an author I recently discovered he's written about power and why people want power and how you you know through empathy you can actually gain power etc and he talks about it in like business organizational context but even from those, like there's so much, so many resources to be learned. And when you combine that with morality, when you combine that with a, with your own sense of ethics, even sometimes the sources of information are uh, not, the, not the most sort of, uh, uh, sort of benevolent ones. <laughs> uh, sometimes they're from the business world. Sometimes it's from economics. I've read, for example, uh, Jim Collins, who writes about companies and what makes them great and the, the kinds of companies where people want to be associated with where people want to work at, uh, the properties of them and so on. I've been reading, uh, what else? I don't know, Joseph Campbell and mythology and psychoanalysis and things like that. Those have really helped me achieve a, a better s level of skill in uh, empathy. And it just helps me be useful to people and just helps me be a better person, even though this is not maybe the, the traditional way of acquiring these skills. I really like it. I combine it. I, you know, practice yoga and meditation very often, and I sort of combine it with the philosophies of there. And obviously, I'm also deeply interested in uh, uh, in religion, secularly, as a way of like, it's a resource that we can all learn from, right? There's so much to learn from all of the religions and all of the philosophies in the world. But uh, what what am I trying to get to with all of this? I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to get to something super... I, I definitely have... I definitely have just one more to add. There's um, or one more bit. While while you're speaking, I got to think a little bit more. There's there's definitely contribution. I mean, there's contributions from a lot of factors in my life, my journey. But I think that you know, coming from South Africa is definitely an influence. You know, I've seen proper poverty. Uh, I've I've you know I've seen, uh, you know the the cost of a life here is is you know cost of life here is a lot you know less than other places in the world you know people die here over you know pretty petty stuff um and i've seen that you know it's like pretty close by um and that's probably influenced um in south africa we have a really 
incredible outdoor scene where you know we we're always in the mountains um it's a very beautiful place and we're always in the sea and i think we often do this and this is you know level deeper is we often do this to combat you know the the dark sides of living here is you know we try and tap into the best stuff we can you know i admittedly i live in a bubble um i'm in such like i have my bum in the butter here versus most of the country um and I'm just trying to just enjoy every day. But like at the same time, like being surfer and having spent so much time traveling and chasing waves and being in the sea and chatting to people and, you know, campfires, sea air, lots of time offline. It's definitely, you know, molded me in a way. Um, I've experienced like, I swear traveling is like as well, like you talk about empathy. I know like empathy, that word is funny. Is you conscious? It's all contributes. It all contributes. And like, it's who you've spoken to you in your entire life. And by traveling, it's a lot of people chase bands, chase music, chase friends, chase, you know, design conferences. It's a rich life. And I, th- I feel it's all contributed. But, it, but, but, but the big one is I've just identified that I can't have the victim mentality. There's a million things to um, be the victim about in South Africa. You know, the podcast, like the three of the guests are recorded on battery because I didn't have electricity. It's like, this is stuff, this is stuff I don't talk about online because it's just unproductive. It's like, what's the point? People have it way worse than me. So it's like that, that mindset. It's like, I got to go get it. I'm, I'm the one in the, in myself, like complaining online is, it's just, it's such a waste of my energy where I only have limited time in a day to produce hundred percent. But I was, I wanted to get to some place that is actually very mundane I, and, you know, experiencing these things. The difficulties, I've also seen things, you know, being from Turkey, it's not Sweden. Sweden is like a different place. It feels like Star Trek over here, to be honest, especially when I, when I first moved, I was like, what utopia did I, <laughs> did I come to? But anyway, that's one way to gain wisdom. We gain wisdom through experience and uh, especially through unpleasant experiences sometimes, but also the pleasant ones. Another way is, of course, books, and that's the mundane thing that I wanted to get to. So, do you have any like book recommendations that maybe you find yourself recommending frequently to people already? I know you're a big reader. Uh, that's incredible. I'm I'm quite, I don't want to say jealous, just say envious, uh, to people that that can get a re- reading rhythm down. I just find that you know, with the the kid and the editing the podcast, I mean, some edits are like you know twenty, thirty, forty hours, and it's like for me to just sit and read a book, it's like it's absolutely impossible in my life because I'm either sleeping, working, and I really want to surf. And it's like for me to just, I feel so unproductive reading. I cannot explain it. But in in my life, I mean, there's been some influential books, but Derek Sivers is definitely he just every word he writes, like I can resonate with um you know he's on my bookshelf at the back here you know anything you want is probably the best book i've ever read because it's the one i couldn't put down there's that cliche i couldn't put down it's the only book i've ever finished in one go sat on the bed and i demolished the whole thing you know what it takes for me to finish a book in one go because i normally work so hard and i just fall asleep in one chapter i'm dead just like i'm just out so Derek Sivers, anything you want is the number one recommendation of mine. I felt that way with the first Harry Potter book. I remember reading it and then actually re- I read it two times in one sitting. That was how good it was, I thought. Uh, it's just such a, that's, I mean, there's a reason why it's so famous. It's so well written, such a good, such a good uh, sort of just piece of writing, you know, as an artifact. It is the end of our time that we scheduled together, so... I want to conclude with asking you if there's a question that I should have asked you, but I haven't. Is there maybe, could be something like, maybe it's a question that only you in the world can answer about design. <laughs> what what would that question be <laughs> that has been unasked? So, I, you know, at the end of the day, what are we trying to do? Are we trying to educate people? Are we trying to get to know each other? Are we... Are we trying to just have a great conversation? And I feel like, you know, I wouldn't change a thing. But if you, you know, one thing that I could maybe add more value of is, you know, like what are what are trends, you know, what are things that are upcoming? And I feel like, yeah, you know, that, that that's not as interesting as asking deeper life questions, which you did ask. So I want to say that it was perfect. 
trends are ever changing. One of the things that people maybe don't realize about my podcast, I don't know if this is true for you, but in my podcast, it has been cases where it's been like months, even there's one case that's been more than a year between recording and publishing the thing, the editing took so long and now it's shorter. Now I have a better workflow, but uh, I like to focus on the timeless topics in this, in this podcast, you know, it could be like wisdom uh, books, you know, graphic design and things like that. My favorite movie. Oh yeah. What is it? Um, you didn't ask me that. And that's more, in- that's more interesting than design. Ooh, okay. Are you into like filmmaking and things? Uh, so it's definitely something because of, I think, the levels of creativity and the layers to what it takes to create something that's spectacular. Like I I am in awe of what it takes to like, for example, uh, create a, what kind of film? And even a Wes Anderson film, you know, just like one scene is just... Oh, that's so much work when those like just colors, the set design... But it's just like for me to like devour, I'm like drooling while watching that stuff, just the behind the scenes and like actually listening to the editor, even if he's just speaking, if I don't, even if I don't hear visuals, like he's just describing what it takes, like where's Anderson rocks up and he's like, cool, we do the scene the next day rocks up. He's like, the sky is better today. Can you put today's sky in what we filmed yesterday? You know, and the editor's like, yeah, we can, but it's going to take like a week. <laughs> Anyway, so like I love that because I just know how how difficult it is. Anyway, favorite movie ever, Donnie Darko. Um, I could, I, I could speak about films for a long time. This, this not do it, but uh, I just want to say is like I have a massive respect and and editing and having fun with this podcast and adding music and layers and intros and stuff has been extremely rewarding for me. Like I will spend probably longer on the intro than the entire in, in, edit, uh, and it's worth it for me because I'm learning something new and I'm being creative. Yeah, and it's you know the result is just it's so good. You just you're making one of the best design podcasts that I've ever listened to. I think it's such a pleasure to to hear you on there and your guests and the production level. The production quality I think is better than people with like maybe a hundred times their budget because you put so much love in it and it shows. You know the sound effects. You were that's why that that that's what made the episode with uh, uh, again I forgot his name but Bunsen founder. Matthew Smith, that's what made me, because he was telling the story of how they came up with the name Bunsen for their agency, which serves like scientific companies. The flame sound. Yeah, the sound of the Bunsen burner. It took me back to my high school. You know, I'm in like junior year and I go into the science class and we're burning up like chemicals. That that was so good. Audio, yeah. more powerful than video. Loved it. For sure. So yeah, thank you for this, Rob. This has been an absolute pleasure. This has been, I feel like we could just go on and on. I, I would love to have you for another round later. This, it was very nice to meet you. Hopefully we connect in, in real life and we can continue. That would be lovely. Do you ever travel to like Europe, Turkey maybe? Uh, my brother left South Africa, he married a Norwegian woman and he lives in Oslo. So I've been to Oslo um, and he, he drives to Sweden to buy meat and beers and he bought a front door the other day. Because it was like, <laughs> it's like it was way cheaper in Sweden. Norway is one of the most, most expensive places in the world. Like Sweden is 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 is, is or all right compared to that. But uh, yeah, Oslo is just a three hour drive from here. I would love to, uh, you know, just let me know when you when you're there, and I'd love to meet you up and either show you around here or you know, come hang out in Oslo together. Great, it's a date. Yeah. Uh, also, off the record, there are super good windsurfing spots in Turkey. Also, kite surfing, if you're into that. I don't know, maybe you do wave surfing. But like... nah, it's, it, it, some friends have been to Turkey and told me how good it is. It's definitely not, a, it, I'm, I'm not into that. But uh, yeah, respect, it's great out there. It's so lovely. Anyway, thank you so much, Rob. Cool, man. Thanks. Super, super nice to be with you today. Thanks for having me.